Ok, uh, muy buen día, gracias a todos por venir. ¿Qué tal? Hello, I'm Josef Dabernik. Um, and who of you has used the rules module in Drupal 7 or 6? So I guess more than half of you. That's cool, awesome. And today I'm talking about rules in Drupal 8. It's not ready, disclaimer. But we can already see a lot of things and hope uh, there will be stuff that gets you interested. <clears throat> my name is Josef Tabernik. Uh, my Twitter handle and wherever in the community you can find me as Dasio. Uh, I'm originally from Austria. That's in Europe. That's the capital city is Vienna. Um, but I recently moved to Zurich to work with the amazing guys from Amazy Labs. So I work as a deputy head of technology, together with Michael Schnitzel. Uh, you probably know him from taking pictures of DrupalCons. Together we run a team of 12 developers. And we also have sister companies in Austin and another company, Amazing Metrics, which is specifically dedicated to um, SEO solutions. <clears throat> um, yeah, that's our team. So we're very dedicated to design, um, and we always have job offers open if you want to move to Zurich or Austin, and you feel like you, you want to be part of that amazing team, obviously let us know. Um, well, you might also know me from contributed modules like the Facet API Pretty Paths, or my master thesis that I wrote on GeoCluster, which is about how can I put uh, millions of points on a map and still have a performant user experience? <clears throat> but what really keeps me passionate for Drupal is not just the technology, but you guys, the community. And actually, I started using Drupal extensively when I lived in Central America. And there I started doing uh, Drupal tours. So I traveled from down Nicaragua, through El Salvador, Guatemala, Belize, and Mexico. And two years later, I traveled again down to Costa Rica um, doing presentations about Drupal because I think uh, the ability to share um, is what helped me being um, a successful contributor and a successful, um, like doing a successful business with, with Drupal. So I think it's, it's very crucial that we share this knowledge. And this, this also uh, makes me very happy to be able to be part of the first Latin American DrupalCon. Yes. Okay. So far for the intro. D8 Rules is an initiative that is um, not just me, but we are actually a team. Uh, surprise, all of those five guys, we are from Austria. Um, there is the creator of the rules module, Fago. You might know him also from other modules like the Entity API, Field Collection, Profile 2, and much, much more. And Klaus is his co-maintainer. We also have Fubi on the team. He is uh, the creator of the Omega 4 module. Um, and, and they are very dedicated Drupal core contributors. Um, I'm responsible for communication, and we also have a designer on board. Nico has also done quite some designs. They have the, the Drupical website. Maybe you know that. Drupical is a website where you can have a nice overview of all the, of all the Drupal events. Well, and so together, we figured the rules module in Drupal 8, it's going to be difficult. The reason is rules is a very complex module. Has anyone ever debugged? the rules module. Has ever, anyone ever tried to, to step the back through rules? It's, how did you like it? Yeah. <laughs> I had the same experience. So um, we figured it's going to be hard um, because those guys are really, really busy. Uh, Klaus is working on the security team. Uh, Fago is maintaining Drupal core modules. He's running his own business. Um, but um, we kind of want to do this, so we formed a team, and we did some other steps that I will explain later. But what is rules, actually? I mean, 
There's this, there's this great presentation from Ami Taibu. Uh, you should look it up. It's, um, it's from DrupalCon Copenhagen, which was my first DrupalCon. It's about organic groups. And Ami Taibu was interviewing different people from the United Nations. And there he has a quote where Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, she says, there must be rules on the world. Uh, so I guess at some point we all need rules. We also need rules in our community. We even have a code of conduct which helps us be respectful with each other. Um, but rules, obviously, in terms of Drupal, it's more about I want to have some logic in the system. I want to make something happen on the website. <clears throat> So there's an acting user or some, something that's happening on the system. It doesn't have to be a person, per se. It can also be like a cron job that's running. That's generating an event. And then we have some conditions to validate, do we really want to do something right now? For example, um, the, use, the content has been updated. And if the condition, the content offer is different the, than the acting user, then I want to invoke something. Let's have an action. And in this case, I will send out a notification. That's the very basic concept of rules. And by just combining any kind of event with any kind of condition and any kind of action, we actually can create what we call in software engineering a Turing complete machine. So it basically allows us to do any programming. Um, the cool thing is, I mean, you can do this in code. But the rules module allows you to do this via the admin user interface. So it, it really is an efficient way to create those events, specify the conditions based on all the metadata that is available in the system, and then react on it. <clears throat> so rules really is about building flexible workflows using those events, conditions, and actions. And for example, we often give it to our clients so, so then that they can customize the emails they want to send out. Have you ever had the experience that the client wants to change some, you, some string that has to be sent out, and you have to ask your developer to change that string in the code, and you have to deploy it? It's really tedious, right? And it's, it's not the work that we want to do on a daily basis. So why not just set up a rule that the client can configure their, themselves? <clears throat> yeah, we can also create custom redirections system messages, um, and the rules module has shown to be pretty successful. It's, it's not something that you would install on every site. I also know a lot of people that say, I don't need rules, I don't like this module, it's not, it's not the way that a developer should work with the system. It's like this clicky thingy, right? Um, but on the other hand, we can see that there's hundreds of integration modules it integrates into the whole, the whole system that makes Drupal so powerful. Um, we expose all the entity metadata, the, the fields. We can iterate upon views. Um, we can access all, all the data from hundreds of integration modules. So on one hand side, rules might be considered as, as a toy that site builders want to play with. But on the other hand, it's also very, very good for the developers so they can they can be forced to specify the, the important APIs. And so, so rules, to, for my feeling, is a very good system that allows the, the, the bridge between the developer and the site builder to be as efficient as possible. <clears throat> because when you provide an integration with rules, you will be sure that anyone can, can integrate. Well. That was kind of the success story of rules in Drupal 7. And for Drupal 8, we obviously had some, some ideas. <clears throat> in general, we've seen from, from the keynote, um, there is a lot of excitement about the object-oriented programming. Rules in Drupal 7 already embraces some of the object-oriented programming. But now we can really rely on the plugins and all the, com on the, on the <clears throat> and all the systems that are already in place for, for Drupal 8, and we don't have to, to bring in our own plugin system, for example. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's like the, base, the general excitement for Drupal 8. But 
what we want to bring as, an, as a rules initiative to the developers is really align how you work with rules with the Drupal 8 developer experience. So the object-oriented style, the dependency injection and everything should be as much a, as aligned as possible and also as we are one of the first big config modules, we want to we wanna show developers how the coding style of Drupal 8 should look like from our perspective. <clears throat> That's by using extensively the plugin system. Um, we are relying on, on all the, the good things that Fago brought into the, into the Drupal project as the entity API, which now has a spin-off called Type Data, which is actually more of an extract, uh, as an, more an ex abstraction, sorry. <clears throat> So type data is really a low level API that, that allows you to specify how the data is structured. And we can use that in entities, we can use that in fields, but we can also use that just for, for parameter configuration because the way that rules works, we, need, we always need to specify some input parameters that we can then process upon and then forward it, for example, to the next action. And all that system can now be, can now be based on the generic type data API that is shared across the whole Drupal 8 ecosystem. And all integrations, like who has used um, panels? Panels module, yeah. So you remember the confusion about context in panels and the context module. Um, context in panels is actually the very same thing as we are dealing with in rules. Because we want to specify the data that we need and then we want to forward it and so on. And the way that panels context work is, is really the same. I mean, you specify I want an input parameter of type user, and then I'm going to use the email address of the user, for example. <coughs> so we have some common problems across Contrib in Drupal 8, and as earlier as possible, we're going to tackle those. The better, um, like, the whole consistency of the system will, will end up being. Deployable config via CMI. I mean, who doesn't love CMI? Um, rules in Drupal 7 already had its own exportables, but now we can really uh, be aligned with the whole system. So I think from a developer's perspective, those are like the big wins that we kind of envision for rules in Drupal 8. And then there's this whole topic I already mentioned a bit about the reusable components. So we're trying to share the context API with projects that already exist, so Page Manager is like a spin-off of C tools in Drupal 8. It's already using the Drupal Core Context API, so we're working together on fixing core bugs or improving those APIs so that, that all the systems can work well together. We will need tokens. You remember, specify an email. Within the email, you want to have a, um, the username being printed, and there's who had problems with tokens in Drupal 7? Incompatibilities, yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to fix all the problems, but at least we are trying. Um, yeah, so we wanna make tokens reusable. <laughs> and then type data, so the way that you can specify parameters. On top of the specification, what rules usually does is exposing a form so that the, the user, for example, can enter the date that is required to execute this component. <clears throat> and that's also used, for example, in use bulk operations, right? So when you, I mean, that's probably something that not everyone has used, but in Drupal 7, you can specify rules components, and then you can tie them into the, the use bulk operations, and, and then, the user can input the data that is that is additionally being configured. So such widgets for for inputting the data and also formatting any structured data, we will have to do it in rules in Drupal 8, and we want to make it reusable because it's not something that is like specific to the rules use case, but it's something that we can solve on a on a general level. And if you have been to the talk of Eclipse to see yesterday. All the thing about um, making components better decoupled, I think it's really important that it's something that we want to embrace uh, during the rules um, Drupal 8 port. And then I think, yeah, embeddable UI components. 
So for example, you could, right now you can already, the Drupal 8 conditions API is already tied into the block system. So what you could also do is then a rules condition could just be exposed into the block UI configuration as a selection rule. Um, so specify the visibility of blocks via rules conditions is for example a possibility that we see here. And finally, I think one of the major advantages of the rules module is obviously the UI and you remember the data selector. I mean there would be so many places in Drupal where we can reuse the same data selector. <coughs> when we in panel specify a context, uh, we could just use the very same data selector as we have it available in rules. So that's kind of um, our vision here. Site builders. Site builders should obviously um, got o get all the admin UI improvements that we have seen on a general level in Drupal 8. So Drupal 8 is much, has a much more consistent UI. Um, unfortunately, at the very same moment, uh, but there's there's a very good session from Louis Nyman about how they created a style guide for the seven theme. So we are working hard on solving the problems that we see for for the rules UI. We haven't implemented it yet, um, but the idea is that all the UI components that we have to have to implement implement for rules, they should be shareable because th there will be similar problems that other modules have to solve. For example, okay, you have you have you need kind of a complex ads dialog. We have already seen that in the views UI, right? So in views, you kind of say add a filter, and then you can select from all the available filters. I mean, in rules, it's pretty much the same. I want to add a, an action. I want to have the actions grouped by category. So why don't we just rely on the same UI patterns? And that will also help site builders use the site more efficiently because when we have the, the similar approaches across the system, it just makes more sense to them. Um, yeah, site builders, as mentioned, the views bulk operations that Larry um, showed in the morning, they are part of Drupal core. So, and there's also an action and conditions API in core. So if we would be able to expose rules actions using the standard actions API, then we would be able to use um, just right away the simple bug operations. I think that's pretty cool. And hmm. who has worked with rules components? Um, I have this experience that working with rules components sometimes is a bit hard. Or creating advanced logic, maybe maybe advanced logic should not be in rules at all. But if we already have the tools available. I want to do an if else, or I want to do this kind of logic, and you really, really quickly hit hit the boundary, where rules forces you to build the logic bottom up. You have to first create the component that you then call in, in the parent rule that you then call above, and nobody understands the system at all anymore. Um, there is there's a there's a contrib module. You should check it out in in Drupal 7. That's called rules conditional, which allows you to create those advanced logics. But for Drupal 8, we kind of feel that in inline rules is a concept that will just help us get rid of all of those problems. So if you're able to, to nest rules in rules using a top-down approach, um, and we haven't figured out a UI on that yet, but I think that will really help us. And if you're, like if any of those ideas get you interested, you should really come tomorrow to the sprints and discuss, discuss details on that with us. <clears throat> so that all sounds nice. Um, I think you already should already go online and download the rules module, right? And then you can just try it out. Um, before that, we have to do it. And it was almost a year ago, just before Drupal Developer Days, um, where I talked to Fago about the concerns that we have that rules will never be ported to Drupal 8 because everyone is just too busy trying to work on Drupal core and contrib is usually an afterthought. But we felt like it's really, really important and this is why we came up 
with with the DA rules campaign. So you probably have seen so, such stickers around. Uh, so we're we're really trying to to make some to get some momentum there. And the vision is that as far as early as rules is there, the earlier other other contributed modules can also um, get their uh, get their integration supported. So the big goal of DA rules is accelerate all all the Drupal 8 uptake altogether. Obviously, site builders will be able to, to create their flexible workflows. And the whole initiative for us is also about making a statement that contribution just takes a lot of time. And we are in an, an open source society where we kind of rely on each other. Um, and I would really recommend, like, I don't want to go too much into, de into detail because this session is more about um, developers, what we can expect for Drupal 8 in rules. But I think the whole discussion about sustainability in Drupal is really, it's really important to have. And Dries did a very, very great keynote in Amsterdam that you can watch online about his vision of how the whole Drupal ecosystem can make um, contribution more sustainable. So check this out. Um, we decided, okay, we will do some crowdfunding. And thanks to those more than 300 individuals donated <coughs> to help us get the rules module ported. Because, as said, the developers, they don't have enough free time. So our decision was um, the companies that employ Fargo and Klausi, they provide a community rate of... Um, it's 45 euros, so in, in Austria that's, that's like, usually in Austria you would charge your clients like 100 euro, for example. But it's like the base cost where they can employ their developers to, to work on it, but they don't make any money anymore. Um, and all those individuals and also those generous companies help us gather funds to, to um, kind of, yeah, the funds that we need to get the rules module ported. And how, how can we up with, with this number? It's basically um, a bit more than 1,000 development hours that have been estimated to port the whole rules module from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. And as you can see, milestone one we have um, successfully funded. We haven't figured out the solution for the other milestones yet. Um, but it was really, really a great success for us to being able um, to motivate so many people to just chip in and help us um, free up some some very precious top develop, top Drupal core developer time to to not only work on Drupal core but also work on the rules module. <clears throat> so we did that. We did that campaign um, about April to May last year. Then we had the money. And then we just had to do it. Um, and we came up, like, the, the development roadmap looks like this. So in Milestone 1, we, we worked on the rules core engine, um, implement all the plugins, the, the rules, actions, and conditions APIs of Drupal core. Our, vi our vision was really to, to, to match them. To, like, if we, wanna, if we can decide to fork the system or we can try to fix it in Drupal core. And as long as Drupal core is not um, frozen, um, that's, that's the thing to do, obviously. Um, so all of these steps, they have a, like an error, so they are like almost, almost complete. Milestone two is about completing the rules engine features, the advanced plugins like events and loops, the entity token support, the CMI integration that has already started, uh, and some generic integration. And then in milestone three, we'll tackle the user interface um, the reusable UI components. We also have to upgrade the, the scheduling. And finally, the existing integrations, rules, ships, which, which uh, with quite some actions that integrate with Drupal Core. For example, there's an action to send out a mail. <coughs> and together with the community in Sprint, we have already uh, ported lots of those core conditions. And that's also, it's, it's really a, a great thing where we, 
where we work together with the community to train all of you on the new Drupal 8 APIs. And we did that at several Drupal camps and Drupal cons. <coughs> and so right now, we already have 45 forks of the rules module, which is uh, developed on GitHub. <coughs> um, all those people have um, patches committed or pull requests being merged. Um, so that's, that's really cool, and thanks to all of those. And if you want to be part of that, find me tomorrow in the sprints. <coughs> okay, so that's how that works. Now, if you're a developer, like, how many of you are developers that kind of would be interested? Oh, awesome, cool. So, and who has already written a rules integration, let's say in Drupal 6 or 7? Implement action condition. Cool, cool. Awesome. So, the way we're going to do this in Drupal 8 right now is. Um, well, we need a working Drupal 8 installation, obviously, and then we go on GitHub and just fork the rules module from Fargo's repository. It's pretty straightforward. As mentioned, already 45 uh, people have forked it. And then we kind of have to figure out what to do there. There, in the issue queue, we have some novice tasks, so the, there's like some, some, some pretty easy tasks to get started, but most of them are a little bit more advanced. <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to walk you through the, the different APIs that you will work with. So, because, and I've, to make a disclaimer, I'm not, I'm not a professional, like, on a daily basis, I'm not developing anymore. I have a background in computer science, but um, I wouldn't consider myself as the best developer at the Maisie Labs. I'm more, I'm more like specifying tasks and reviewing all that stuff. So. Bear with me if, if there's any errors or uh, in there. But I tried my best to, to, to understand what, what Fargo and Klausi and, and, <coughs> and Fubi did there. Okay, so there's different APIs in Drupal 7 for rules, and one of them allows you to expose structured data to the rules. So in Drupal 7, we have the rules data info, and we can also, all, like the whole entity, API, the entity property system, is exposed. So there's those two, in, there's those two hooks. One to add new data, if you want to expose, for, for example, you have some custom table in your database and you want to you make rules aware of the, of the custom structured table, you can do that via rules data info. Or if you want to add some additional properties, you just do it with the entity property info alter and rules will automatically pick up. It's the same process, for example, that we use with when uh, working with search API. If we want to index something in addition, we just create our own properties, um, which is cool. So in Drupal 8, we have the whole type data system. And the type data system, as said, allows us to access the structured data. And there's, um, there's some interfaces. Um, there's the primitive types and the complex types. And I will show you some examples. <coughs> So you can see that there's a. Let's see if I can do. Oh yeah. Okay, there's a primitive base, that for example the the floating class extends, and we can already see that uh -huh, there's some annotations being used. And yeah, it's pretty straightforward. The 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 primitives <coughs> need some castings. And then there's there's more complex. <coughs> more complex properties that would, that, um, so if, for example, if, if something is like, like a structure, um, what we do here is, is specify all the properties in the property definition function. Like for example, the link item has a URL and the title and so forth. But I tried to reduce those uh, examples to the, to the most important stuff. So that's the way that we can describe data in Drupal 8. Um, so basically, all you, all you have to do in Drupal 8 is uh, implement your own data type plugins. So it's just a, it's just a plugin class that will, that will be picked up by the system, and then rules can also deal with that. And the entity property info alter is now a standard Drupal hook that is called hook data type info alter. 
Okay, but the, the, usual, the usual stuff that you do when working with rules is you want to create your own actions, you want to create your own conditions, you want to create your own event. And to do that, let's get like a quick introduction in the whole object-oriented programming style that has changed quite a lot from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. <clears throat> so we're using um, annotations to describe the plugins that we have instead of info hooks. We have auto-loading, so um, you just put the plugins under a, specif a specified folder and file structure and the system will automatically recognize them. Um, yeah, and there's also a, like discovery is, based, is basically together with the auto-loading and derivatives. We have not implemented any derivatives for, for, for rules yet, but we will certainly have them. So imagine there is a create entity action. We could create derivatives that says create entity of type node action or create a user action, create a taxonomy term action. This would basically be derivatives of a standard plugin based on their based on their entity type. So how do we provide conditions? In in Drupal 7, we had some, some info hooks and some callbacks, uh, not very well structured. I I think that the way that we have it now in Drupal 8 is is, is much more approachable because you have everything self-contained um, as the following example. So this is the class that says node is sticky. So I have a condition that checks if a node is sticky. And instead of the info hook that is somewhere else in the system, I really have it right next to, right next to the class in the annotation, which is a, there's no, there's no first class annotations in, in PHP, but we use the, the doc blocks um, to get there. Um, so the condition itself, what we usually expect in an info hook um, is now within the annotation. And we can see that, for example, there's some add translation tags which allow us to, to, make, to make that translatable. Um, I will get into the context later on. But that, that just tells the system, okay, I will have now a, uh, the machine name rules node is sticky um, in the category of the nodes. Uh, so this condition is now based on that annotation being registered. And that's it. Then what do I have to do? I will just extend the rules condition base and implement the evaluation function. I will explain the context later, but what, what the condition usually does is return a true or false value. So in this case, we are checking if the node is sticky, and that's all what the rules, what the rules do. Yeah. So who thinks this is too complicated? Cool. Awesome. <laughs> Okay, um, actions. Uh, it's pretty much the same. We again have the annotation. In this case, we have an action that deletes any entity. We could have derivatives which allow us to delete just nodes. Um, but for the sake of simplicity, let's just keep it with the entity delete. Um, and instead of an evaluate, we have an execute function and that's it. Pretty straightforward. Finally, events. Oops, we don't have events yet. <laughs> so, um, yeah. It's just not, it, it just hasn't been implemented yet. Um, so, what we have right now is, is all the actions and conditions. We already have like 10, 10 conditions, 10 actions ported. And it's pretty cool. I mean, it's not only this, but we, we will see how to, how to test them later on. But it's, it's a really good way to, to get on in the whole into the whole plugin system of Drupal 8. Um, good. Context. So rules have to, have to act upon a specified context. So all the data that the rule gets, for example, the event would be Entity has been created. Obviously, there is an entity to be expected that we want to work upon in the system. And the way we do this is in the annotation, we also have the context keyword, which allows us to specify the context that this uh, action 
expects. So in this case, the entity delete needs an entity um, which should be deleted. It's pretty easy. And we can see it down there. We can get the entity by this get context value and the value just corresponds to the key up there. And yeah, in this case, it's of type entity, but this could be any type data. So I could also get a parameter of type float, for example, and then it would just be the same. So that's, that's the way we specify the context. And for using the context, I have a more complex example here. So there's an action that's called data list item remove. So I, I will get um, a list of items. And I will also get just a single item. And what this basically does, it's just iterating over all the items in the list, checking for the items that match. Um, it's removing them. And in this case, we're not only getting the context, we're first getting the list of items and the individual item, but we also have to update the context. So the, the new list will now be um, used, like kind of similar to if it's being treated as a reference. And that's how the context here works. <clears throat> and then we have, uh, so we have been working with the, with the context that we receive. We have updated the context, but in some cases, the actions also provide new values. So in this case, fetch entity by ID, we'll get an entity type and the entity ID, and then do its magic using the, the entity manager by, by loading the specific entity. What it will do in the end is set a provided value so that all the subsequent actions in the rules execution stream will be able to access um, it with, with this name. Okay, that was using context, so we can get a context, we can set a context, and we can set provided values. This, this, I guess this is really the basics that, that you really, really need when you work with the rules system. Um, there's also a way to, to use rules programmatically. So what we can see here is um, there is an expression manager. So everything in rules is an expression, like an action is an expression, and a, an event is an expression, a condition is an expression. So the expression manager allows us to create a rule. And in this case, we specify <coughs> that there should be a context of type string. And yeah. then to the created rule with the context, we can add a condition. And what we do now is a context mapping. So the text, the text that's needed, it should be a, a select, and that's then mapped to the test here. Um, and finally, um, we can add an action to be executed and set the, set the value um, test to be the test value and then execute it. So that's, like when you're not using the user interface, I, I, did, I did that in, has anybody used the rules API with, without the interface? We did it quite some time because, I don't know, you have used the, the entity metadata wrapper and it's just a bit easier like from, from, the, from the command line. All right. <clears throat> And then, a bit more of an uh, advanced example with context is that, for example, consider a condition that provides the provided text variable. Then there's an action which provides a concatenated vari variable. Variable, <laughs> sorry. In the end, we, we sometimes need the context mapping because um, if the same action was executed twice, it would just override the, the, previous, the previous provided parameter. And if we, if we specify the mapping here, we can say that the second action, the second root test string, instead of concatenated, the, va the variable should be named concatenated to. That's basically what rules does internally. Maybe you've 
you have noticed that when, when adding the add variable action several times, the variables will just ha get different names. I mean, obviously it makes sense to do so. Yeah. All right, um, about storing configuration. So in, in Drupal 7, we have different systems how to export configuration data. We have the whole C2 exportable um, ecosystem and features. And rules kind of had its own system in terms of, um, because for readability, we decided to provide um, some, some kind of JSON export. So whenever you look at an exported rule in Drupal 7, you will see that it's it's pretty well indented and it's not just a serialized um, array or just a serialized dump, um, but it's actually a, a predefined JSON output of the, of the rule. <coughs> yeah, and that's all the functions that we have in Drupal 7. In Drupal 8, it's gonna be much easier. So we will just rely on the, on the YAML files. Um, we're, still, we're still working out some details there and it's not implemented. Um, it would just just be easier to operate. <clears throat> yeah, so that's that. I guess th that concludes the basics that you deal with um, when working with rules in Drupal 8. Um, you will want to specify additional metadata to be ex exposed to rules. You will have to implement the, AP, um, the actions, the events and conditions, and you will uh, obviously deal with the context API. Context API, by the way, is part of Drupal Core. So it's also used in other systems. Um, if you want to look a little bit deeper, you can also specify your own plugins. So um, one example would be the rules conditional module in Drupal 7. It provides an, a separate plugin for the if and else statement. And that's, that you're gonna do just by extending the rules expression plugins. Um, then there's um, specific, the, there's the possibility to specify input evaluators and the possibility to specify data processors. So an example for a data processor would be um, the numeric offset. Um, and I guess you have seen this uh, when you, when you, <coughs> when you import, uh, when, when you have an action that requires a number you can also use the data selector to select, for example, the, um, let's say, the, the count of users or whatever you have stored there. But the, the numeric offset would allow you then to, to just add a number as an offset to that. Yep, user interface. It's not there, sorry. <laughs> you don't need it. Yeah. I mean, the APIs are so beautiful. Why, why would you ever need a UI? <laughs> yes. Yeah, we should, we should do a console integration tomorrow. Um, there have been some proposals. I mean, I, I think the rules UI is kind of controversial. It's, some say uh, it's too overwhelming. Some say it's too limited. Um, it's, it's, I guess it's really hard to to make a perfect user interface for such a generic tool that we have. Um, so there was a re research project called Fluxcraft. Um, it's really interesting. It's, it's not just about the UI stuff. Fluxcraft is about creating the whole web automation, like if this then that.com, but based on open source technology. So the idea of Fluxcraft was to use rules and all the uh, user interface capabilities um, to create an if this then that based on open source technology. And part of that was creating UI proposals to make it more simpler. So the, the rules user interface sometimes is considered to be just too complex. Um, and I have a, a ticket in the queue um, that lists all the references. So if you're interested in, in studying those proposals, um, there is the Fluxcraft UI. Um, there's, a, there's a module that's been around for quite a while, but it never was really picked up. I guess it's not that the concept 
is not so cool, but maybe the implementation was not great. But that already exists. Rules transformers already exists in Drupal 7. It would be just another way of how you do the programming in a visual style that you have like the individual actions and then um, input parameters and output parameters can just be connected in, in a flowchart style. There is also the NoFlow project which got some, quite some momentum on Kickstarter. Um, and some of, like, Fubi is thinking about we should experiment with a, with a JavaScript-based front-end for, um, for the rules configuration. Um, yeah, there's a ticket, 225-1267. Um, if you're interested in chiming into the discussion, um, I think this is the time where we can incorporate feedback. But um, the 1,000 hours that we have estimated will not include any fancy user interface. So the plan for the initiative still is pretty much port the existing use rules interface to the, to the new technologies of Drupal 8, but iterate like in smaller pieces where we, where we, where we kind of see <coughs> opportunities to streamline. We, we, at the moment, we do not plan to, to make a crazy rewrite. But as everything is pluggable, anyone can come and implement the rules user interface at, at their taste. Yeah. <laughs> so while the UI is not there, how, we, how can we do stuff with rules? I mean, it's super boring. Um, we implement our actions, we implement our conditions, but we don't know if they really work. And as everything in Drupal core, we embrace automated testing quite extensively. Um, we have some unit tests to test uh, the individual components internally. Um, but rules is really more about integration because we, we kind of need the action manager, condition manager, type data manager. It doesn't really make sense for us to mock all the systems. So mocking in automated testing is is you really focus, in a unit test, you really focus on that unit that you want to test. And if that unit has interdependencies on other systems, you usually create mocks for them. <clears throat> so we are kind of in a, hybrid, in a hybrid situation where we don't bootstrap all the Drupal system for performance, and we don't really need it. Um, but still, we're writing more integration tests because it doesn't really make sense to as you've seen before, the execute statements are usually just one or two, two lines of an action. It doesn't really make sense to just test this part. Or we feel that it, <clears throat> it makes more sense to, to, the, to test the integration here. OK, let's look at an example. Um, data list count is, is uh, a condition that checks if the count is equal, less, or, or more. So you have two. Basically, three import imper <coughs> sorry, three parameters. You have the list, you have the operator, and the value. And based on the combination, it will just return if the data list count is greater, equal, or lower than. Okay, pretty straightforward condition. And the test. That's a that's an abbreviation. We have lots of more test cases. But how it looks like it um, it, it it extends the integration test base. And then what we do is um, yeah, we create a condition and we set all the context values, like the list should be 1, 2, 3, 4, operator greater than 2. So the list count of a list with four items should be greater than 2. So what we do is assert that this condition evaluates to true. Easy. And vice versa, um, should should not be equal zero, the count of a list um, that has three items. So we are asserting false that it's equal. Um, that's the way how the tests look like. And then we also have the entity integration test base, which brings in the whole entity system. So usually in those tests, when you look at them, you would have to do a lot of bootstrapping. You have to mock all the systems, get, get all the managers ready for you. So this is why we have some test bases that allow you to do so. <clears throat> Let's look at um, another condition, entity is of type. 
So we get the entity, we get the type string, and then we just return if the entity type matches. Now when we look at the test for this, this took me a little longer to <laughs> figure out how it works. Um, so what we do is um, we create a mock for the entity. So we don't really create, we don't do an entity create or we don't um, instantiate a real object, but um, we get a mock that implements the entity interface. And then we set expectation. <coughs> So we, we expect this entity, I mean, it's, some, it's like you create something that's not there, but you specify how it should look like, because that's the only thing that you really care about. Um, so what I care about here is that get entity type ID should, should be called twice later on. And that, that kind of struck me, because right now I already have to think about what's coming down there, and that's not the way my programming um, mind worked so far? Well, anyways, let's just assume this is how we do it. Um, so we expect get entity type to be called twice, and it will always return node. So we now have a fake object that on twi two times on get entity type it ret will return node. And what we're going to do with it? Um, <clears throat> down here, we get, uh, we set we have the condition and we set the context value entity to be the mocked entity. And we set the context value of the condition to be node. And, and then we check um, this condition should evaluate to true because we have a mock object that returns node um, set and we are checking for node so this should be true. And then in a second test case, <clears throat> we set the context value to taxonomy term and now we assert to false. And like all those two together match the exactly two. Yep, that's it. Boom, boom. All right. Um, just a quick mention: um, if you dive into the rules APIs, uh, you will you will deal with the rule state that keeps track of, of all the variables that allows rules to deal with uh, or to apply the data selection. So based on the current execution state which obviously changes from every action being executed or every condition being executed, the state kind of changes. If the condition is being executed, rules usually knows a bit more about the variables that are available. This is, for example, the reason why often you have to put an entities of type or uh, entities of bundle condition in the beginning of your rule so that you later can access properties. So the system defers automatically <clears throat> based on conditions, it knows more about the entity. Um, that's all handled in the rule state. Also, auto-saving is a feature that rules has. So sh for performance reasons, it doesn't do a save on every, on every single action, but it does um, in a more intelligent way. Um, traits, yeah. Who has used traits? Anyone has used traits? Okay, uh, we use them, and what are traits? Traits kind of solve the, the problem of multiple inheritance. Uh, we are not, we are not able in, in PHP to inherit from, from two parents. So if I'm a car, I cannot be both a vehicle and uh, an object if they are not parents of each other. Um, so, <clears throat> and there's a quote that says, Traits are basically copy and paste on the compiler level, or on the, is it really the compiler? Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, well, um, there's, there's, a, there's one trait that you, that you really, when you deal with Drupal 8 code, you will quickly find it. It's the string translation trait. And all it provides us is the T function. As in Drupal 8, we do not want to use globals. Uh, uh, like in, in Drupal 7, the T function is just a function that you call globally. Um, but in Drupal 8, we usually rely on, <clears throat> on services that provide us the functionality. And bootstrapping those services is just like takes a bit of instantiation with all the dependency injection that I will not show today, but you will definitely uh, find it out in other sessions. 
<clears throat> so basically, the string translation trait is something that can be used in as many classes as we want to. String translation um, will be a requisite that we want to, for example, have in my class. I want to use string translation. And then in any function, I can just call this um, the method t if it, was, if it was declared in my class. So a really powerful concept. Um, you have to use it wisely. Um, you can also rename, rename classes. So if you, if you have two traits that conflict with each other with the same method names, you can uh, use traits a bit more in, a, in an advanced way. But maybe it will also freak your developers out when, when they try to debug stuff. <coughs> yeah, we use traits for the context. So there's a rules context trait. Um, so there's a context aware plugin base in Drupal core, but we need a bit more um, to being able to deal with the provided values, for example. That's not part of the course context system. And we use it both in the action base and in the condition base. So that's a use case where we, where we kind of need traits because we, can, we, we want to inject functionality in a horizontal way into, into many classes without uh, them being crazily inherited from each other. Yeah. So, just a reminder, if you want to be part of this, if that sounds fun. Contribution can be many things. Can just give us money. No? Uh, we use it, we don't, we don't waste that money. Uh, we really use it for, for solving hard problems and uh, we try to give back as much as possible to the whole community. So I guess if you know anybody interested in donating to, to rules, I wouldn't encourage yourself being for because you're already part of this community. It's, we, should, we should talk to the people that have much money to get this done. Um, yeah, you can just talk about it. You can help us with graphic design. Uh, you can set up a sprint. Um, we're happy for any help regarding documentation, bug reports, and, 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 and. So there's lots of opportunities to, um, to help us out. So currently, we are porting actions and conditions. Mm. And you can find more information here or just directly at the sprints tomorrow. And that kind of concludes my session. So I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you.